So, um, so today I'm going to talk about the like sort of our design process to uh, to to finally come up with the uh, design for Nervous Common Knowledge Base. And um, so as I go through this, a lot of it is going to be very um, okay. So a lot of it's going to be very sort of problem driven or context driven. So instead of having you guys like dive into the final uh, solution or, or, or design, so we wanted to talk about uh, sort of walk you guys through the process that we walk through. And you know, if you are also designing a layer one protocol, the economics for a layer one protocol, I think will be very uh, will be very helpful. So, uh, so we started designing this uh, economic model starting last um, September, October, and it took us about three months um, to finally come up with you know what we have today. So in the beginning, you know, it was very uh, as you remember in the beginning it was very like open, feel like a very open space. There's a lot of directions you can go to, and it feels like it's not very useful to. Uh, to dive into the specifics immediately, but to really step, take a step uh, back and think about, you know, if there is an ideal, you know, crypto economics model design for, uh, you know, for a smart contract platform, then what should it be, right? So start from um, some of the design goals. So we want it to be sustainably secure, right? Sustainably decentralized, and then uh, for uh, for all the actors in the system, we want to be able to align all the interests of all the participants in, in, the, in the network. Right? In other words, we want people that participate in the network to um, uh, sort of all help to grow the network instead of fighting each other. Right? And then we want to provide uh, an engine or growth for better generation. So eventually, you know, we want this project to seed, which means that we want to have a way to show people, uh, have a path that how this uh, network itself can generate value, and finally, that uh, because you know people hold tokens and then they come in for a hope to be able to you know capture value and have appreciation appreciation of the tokens, right? So we want to be able to provide uh, community value capture as well, right? So these are some of the high level goals when we started. Um, and then we took a look at you know the you know the current landscape and see uh, we look at a lot of different projects and then um, you know identify some sort of you know again going back to okay um, okay uh, so this is sort of going back to some of the points we uh, referred to in the first slide right so we first examined security and what we see is um, a lot of the crypto economics are you know when projects are designing their crypto economics is usually to facilitate the consensus process, right? To give the incentive for participants in the consensus process, uh, in the uh, consensus process to reach reach agreement, right? But on the other hand, there are a lot of new and unproven consensus design, right? So uh, this is where people spend a lot of time. And then uh, the next one is we look at we sort of look at you know when we study Bitcoin and Ethereum, uh, you know Bitcoin has a hard cap, and then we look at the literatures. That talk about you know discuss this problem. We see that you know having hard caps could be two problems. Again, this is you know not not a discover uh, discover you know the sort of by us, but uh, a lot of the newer projects are also sort of like to have um, uh, sort of our hard cap model. You know, for instance, um, uh, Grin and also um, RSK. So these are also well, Grin is not really as more complex, but again they. Look at Bitcoin's uh, issues model, and then uh, see having how, how having hard caps could be two problems. And uh, so I'll I'll just briefly mention this right high variance of block reward makes it attractive for wealthy blocks. So so imagine you know when you have the um, uh, the block reward stops for Bitcoin, right? So when there is block reward, that means as a miner you know there's always going to be like a pot of gold if you walk forward, right? So if you just proceed to carry the next block, there's going to be a, um, a you know, there's going to be for sure a block reward that you can get. On the other hand, if there's no block reward, then there's going to be a, a very huge variance. Just really depends on how many transactions are, um, you know, people send during that block time, right? So there could be a very high variance of block reward, 
so that you know if you know there is a block on the side, then you can fork, right? So it's a lot more incentive to do that, to fork the wealthy blocks instead of moving forward. Um, self to mining can be profitable for a miner with arbitrary low hash power rate. Uh, again, you know there's a paper that you can you can read this. Uh, you know just if you just Google CCS16, you can probably find it. Okay, so not having hard caps could be also a perceived problem because again, right? People want to be able to um, you know purchase the tokens and be able to you know uh, capture part of the value that the network generates. And then if there's no uh, guarantee, like what's the percent that they can capture? Right? Having hard cap means if I purchase one token in Bitcoin, I can capture one out of twenty one um, million of the Bitcoin numbers value, right? On the other hand, if there's no hard cap, that's very difficult to say over time. Um, okay. Uh, okay. So, um, so when, when we move to the sort of more multi-asset platform, so Bitcoin itself is a, is a single asset platform. So we move to a multi-asset platform like the Ethereum. So there is this interesting problem that we identify, we call this heavy assets problem. Right, so um, whenever you have more assets, the assets are more valuable, right? Then, uh, you know, for example, if you know on Ethereum, if CryptoKitties is worth, uh, you know, hundred million dollars, um, and then Ethereum, Ether itself is worth ten million dollars, right? So instead of breaking, looking for bugs in the CryptoKitty smart contract and try to break that smart contract, people could just simply break the security of the, the base platform. To do that, so really the base, the base platform security is is like the upper cap of how much asset that can uh, it can carry on top of it, right? So if the assets becoming too valuable, then uh, then what happens, right? So we want to make sure the the platform itself can capture part of this value, so that it can sustainably generate the necessary security for the assets on top of it. Um, okay, so decentralization, right? So that's the second bullet point, I believe, um, uh, in the first slide. Um, so this comes down to how you can incentivize people, or you can allow people to uh, rent nodes and you know affordably. Um, so the cost of full nodes, right? So computation bandwidth and storage, and uh, so in both Bitcoin and Ethereum, that uh, we bound the computation and bandwidth. Right, but state storage is not right. So no platform yet is, is binding, it's limiting the, the, the storage. And what if you don't limit the storage, we'll see in the next slide also, it will just whatever you don't provide incentive, then people can do abuse it. Right? And then that will be a, a you know that will harm the decentralization properties of the of the network. So and then you know the the importance of full nodes, I think anyone sort of coming more from Ethereum or, or Bitcoin. Perspective can see this, right? So it's in very important for independent verification instead of relying on somebody else to give you the uh, uh, the recent uh, block data, for example, right? So resilient to the network and to hold miners accountable. Some, you know, you can't only ask miners for for uh, transactions, for example. Uh, you want to be able to independent verify. But if you you know if we don't bind resources, then over time, you will grow that such that only supercomputers can, you know, can only supercomputers can, can run those, and that's a problem. Okay, so this is just an example of growth of Ethereum state. Um, so uh, this is a approximation. This is not really measured in um, in, in, in you know bytes or, or gigabytes. But the recent data, last time we looked at it, it's around ten gigabytes of global storage. So, but it has, you know, so this is to say just from the shape of the chart, it has grown significantly over the years. And this is, again, you know, we have only seen Ethereum for, uh, been only been around for four or five years. Um, and, uh, you know, we haven't really seen really mainstream adoption of the, you know, the overall blockchain tech yet. So we can only imagine if, you know, we really see consumer level mass adoption of the network and how much this will grow. And then, again, put limit on, uh, you know the resources needed to run those. Okay, so um, uh, so one thing that always this is like we only discover this after uh, we go through our design of the group economics that we feel like a lot of the problems we face is already have names in uh, like the uh, mainstream economics, right? 
So we started to you know, say things like try to leave the comments, and then, uh, <laughs> right? So for example, whatever you don't, you know, if there's, if there's a not a you know, institution or, or a system to govern the, the comments, then people tend to abuse it, right? So here is the same, that you can think about decentralization property itself of blockchain as the comments, the comments of property of everybody in the blockchain network. But if you don't limit that, then uh, it could be dis uh, abused. So the problem of transitive storage comments is you only pay once and store there forever. So example here is, you know, for example, EOS did their ICO on Ethereum, right? So that has, so that data is, I mean, that all the tokens already moved to a different blockchain, but the data is still there. And, you know, not only now, but, you know, anytime in the future, anybody wants to run a full node, they will have to download that, that data and have to store that forever. So that is a cost for uh, basically everybody forever in the Ethereum uh, ecosystem. So you don't have to pay once and store the data forever, right? That's, that's not going to be a balanced design. And that, that comes to higher operating costs for, uh, for all the photos. Uh, now Ethereum has the you know, proposal of storage rent, I think exactly to, to target this, uh, this situation. And then later we'll talk about how we, uh, how we look at this. Okay, so another problem we identify is starving layer one problem, right? So uh, we've seen a lot, of, a lot of scaling solutions on layer two, right? So for example, you can think about Lightning Network as a scaling solution on um, Bitcoin Network, right? But if there's more, if transactions are moving to layer two, that means there are going to be less layer one transactions, which means it's going to be less demand for the right tokens. Again, if most of the current token uh, economic design is to have tokens pay for transactions, and if there's less demand for layer one tokens, then um, you know that limit the security budget that a layer one can spend um, uh, to compensate the miners, therefore less secure. Right, and then uh, so this you know this can be a, a cascading problem here. So we call this starving layer one problem. So the you know the question we ask here when we realize this is, how, I mean layer two is going to happen because transactions will naturally move to where the cost is lower, and layer two is definitely going to be lower cost than layer ones. So what we ask ourselves is okay. So given this you know future that we see we're going to be in, how can we design economics model for layer one so that it does not rely on transactions so much? Right. Um, okay. And uh, so interest alignment again is one of the bullet points on the first slide. Um, that if if we want to design a network and we want the network to grow, so we want to be able to we want the, all the participants to have their interests aligned together, so they can you know all together push the network forward. <clears throat> so Bitcoin ecosystem participants not aligned. There are store value users in the system and. You know, this is a pretty common, right? So we already seen fight uh, within the you know Bitcoin community, and and um, you know some people believe this should be more store value, uh, small blocks and big blocks. So I'm gonna you know, skip this here. Um, so Ethereum ecosystem participants, uh, I would say it is also not aligned because if you look at the participants, you have developers, you know token holders, miners, and then you also have asset token holders, right? So for example, you know developers want uh, lower cost on transactions, and then ETH, ho ETH token holders, however, want the ETH token to appreciate, right? So there's a reason that you know in the Ethereum community we often hear you know build so targeted more to developers, not not so much on token holders, right? So it's not a people really don't say a lot like hold in Ethereum instead of Bitcoin. The reason is as a decentralized computation network. Um, uh, you know whether ether itself is you know a hundred dollars or a thousand dollars, right? So you can still, I mean, really, what you need to pay for that kind of computation determine is determined by the demand. Um, you know when you need to submit the computation. If more people happen to also use the uh, the blockchain, they have to pay more. If it's less people, uh, <coughs> sorry. If the demand is less, then you don't have to pay as much. It doesn't matter how much. Uh, ether is worth, and this is why in Ethereum we have this concept of gas to decouple the cost of using that machine from the actual price of Ether. Right. Um, anyway, so uh, and the last one is you know ETH holders or ETH holders keep getting diluted to secure uh, what we said to asset token holders. Right. So for example, if you're MKR, if I'm a maker 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 token holder, right, and I just want to hold my token and maybe not really using it, but I don't want to invest in, in makers. A lot of people are that, like that. 
Um, but you know, to keep my maker tokens secure, you know, in the Ethereum network, I don't have to dilute my tokens, right? However, it's the ETH token holders that keep getting diluted over time to secure all the assets on the Ethereum framework, where um, you know, success maker token, for example, may not contribute to the security of ETH, right? So the, the, the platform tokens sort of holders diluting themselves and to secure other tokens. And then, I mean, it's not a problem that we hear a lot, but I mean, inevitably you start to think about, you know, then why should I hold ETH, right? If I don't do transactions uh, to make gas, then, um, then what do I do that? Okay. Um, okay, so value capture. Uh, so this leads to, we realize that we need to do something called value capture, which means, you know, as the designer from layer one protocols, we want to make sure the layer one protocol can capture part of the value of the ecosystem, um, the economic value of the ecosystem running on top of it, right? Um, so value capture is a multi-asset platform, I kind of talk about that. And then um, the other value capture we, we kind of also uh, thought about, discussed, is value capture in the specific use case. And you know, for example, um, you know, and this is and we know forks going to be going to happen in the future, and especially when the product is more mature. Then, if there is a fork, and how what's the advantage of, you know, what's the advantage of um, let's say the canonical chain against the fork, right? And uh, how can we prevent the value of the blockchain getting sort of diluted or uh, forked away? <clears throat> so, we want to be able to capture that value as well. Uh, okay, so okay, so let's go through the crypto economic design uh, when we arrive there. And hopefully, you know what we talked about in the beginning, give the context of you know what we said in the end. So what we realize is we can't really put you know the concerns of transactions and the concerns of sort of over time perturbation together. So instead, we separate them to two layers, and the the base layer uh, we call common knowledge base, right? So that's it has a single purpose. It's preserving value, right? Or preserving assets to uh, to provide long-term sustainable security to the assets uh, running on top of it. Which means we know there's going to be more you know, efficient transactions that can happen on layer two. But even without transactions, this will still be sustainable. And we'll talk about how. Um, okay. So, uh, so you know, I kind of mentioned this before, right? So there, are, um, the reason they're opposing forces is because they use different type of system resources. When you do transactions, then uh, you are using like once in time resource or renewable resource like bandwidth and uh, computation, right? So the next moment they'll come back again right away. Whereas if you preserve for long term then uh, value or access, then they have to occupy long-term storage, right? So storage is always not regenerable, right? Once you occupy it, you tend to just occupy it, right? So they're not coming back. All right, so now we realize that to really, you know, if we don't want to capture the transaction, but if the token shouldn't be designed to capture, to facilitate transactions, then we have to sort of match the, the nature of the token with the type of system resource that are sort of mirror the use pattern of you know what we want the platform to be, which is perturbation, right? So the only type of system resource that's going to be there long term, and then based on occupation instead of you know transaction utilization moment of time is uh, basically state storage, right? Um, so this is how we design our native tokens. So our native tokens represent um, so one token is basically one byte of the global state, right? So the state storage. One token gives the right to occupy one byte. We'll call that common CK bytes or common knowledge bytes. Um, it's simultaneously a state and money, right? And, or we can say it's it's also fuel as well. So if you want to use the gas metaphor, like ether, like a gas to, to power ether um, competition as a fuel. So we're simultaneously a state because it's more of the sort of occupation based um, model. And the money as well, you can transfer this to somebody else to transfer, to transfer value. Um, and then issuance, right? So, so we, we look at whether we should have a hard cap or not to have a hard cap. I think for a lot of you know layer one protocols, this is probably the thing people debate a lot. Should we have a hard cap like the Bitcoin or not have a hard cap, right? So, um, so we want the monetary policy 
to bound the state, expect the state storage capacity. Um, so that at any moment of the time, it's very predictable how much state that is available. Um, but on the, other time, on the other hand, we don't want a um, sort of ever diluted value of the ser because we also want people, um, um, uh, holders, to want to be able to have a you know pretty predictability that they're always going to capture part of the, the, the network value, right? Um, so we have a uh, we have a Bitcoin-like base issue schedule, right? So uh, so this is like Bitcoin issuing with the block reward half every four years, hard cap drops to zero. So we call this base issuance, right? So basically, we have two type issuance, which is ba uh, base and uh, and secondary issuance. Um, and so this may be a little bit abstract, but I'll give you just from a monetary policy point of view and how we thought about this. So if you think about Bitcoin, and in the beginning, every block has 100 coins, right? And then every block has 50, and then you know, half every four years. So in Nervos, um, the, you know, in the beginning, a block would have, for example, 101 coins, and then you will have 51, and then 26, and then 13.5, right? So part of that halves every four years, and part of it is, is constant, just one. So we call that one coin uh, per block, like we'll call that secondary issuance. Uh, so why do we do that, right? Um, so base issuance is more to incentivize miners to help bootstrap the network, just like, you know, in this case in Bitcoin. Um, and we want, we want two things. First, we want to avoid that one block reward ends, then that unpredictability, I think I talked about in the slides, number two or three. So we want to have an ever going issuance of coin to come as the miners to make them internally compatible to keep uh, mining. <coughs> By the way, in Bitcoin community, this is called a, um, uh, oh gosh, I forgot the name. Uh, uh, I forgot the name, it'll come back to me. <laughs> um, so, um, so in Ethereum community, right, so we talk about how can you, uh, Okay, so let me let me back off from this a little bit, right? So again, think about the purpose of I think Stephanie also in the last converse, uh, the presentation talked about you have to understand the design goal, the, the value proposition of the platform. Now that we have a very clear value proposition, we want to be able to preserve, right? Preserve state. Um, then people have to pay with time, right? How much time they want to occupy the state, and that's how you should make the payment to the miners. And that is all, that's also how we want miners to always have block reward, to always have uh, income, predictable income. So there are two ways we can accomplish this. So first, the first way to accomplish this is more aligned with the Ethereum state run uh, proposal, uh, let's see what we see now, is that what if we just say we charge a, you know, a, a some amount of Ether, right, native token, let's say every 1,000 blocks, right, at a certain interval, we charge them some money. If they don't pay, then they're they're not current, and then we have to you know punish them somehow. But that's one way. Uh, but that's very difficult to implement, right? Because um, you know, oftentimes uh, you know, a smart contract has many participants. Uh, you know, ERC twenty contract has many participants in that you know ICO, and then how do you effectively organize, let's say, ten thousand people to each pay a little bit of ether to make that contract current? And if you don't, and if they don't pay, how do you punish? How do you punish individual person that don't pay? So that's the problem. Um, so, uh, so what we want to do instead is to say, how? What about we can just use inflation instead? Because there's, you know, when we think about the macroeconomics, um, uh, you know, how do you collect revenue for the country or for the government? There's only, you know, <laughs> there are a few ways, and one of them is it's through inflation, right? So inflation would be much easier to collect this rent, to collect the state, to its uh, state rent. So what we're going to do is say, uh, because again, our native token represents a byte of state storage. Some of the bytes will be used, and some of the bytes will not be used. So it would be great we can just target inflate a subset of that native token uh, holders that are using this for uh, to store data, right? So that would be fantastic. So we thought about this target inflation idea that we're going to say, we're going to do, so first we're going to inflate everybody, right? And then the problem with that is, okay, we also inflate the people that are not using the space. They're just holding token. They're not taking this as a resource. So what we do is, 
we inflate everybody, then we look at who is not using that to store data, and then we provide something called nervous DAO, right? This is basically a system level smart contract, if you will. So they can deposit their token to that smart contract, and then they can get basically paid back, right? Compensated, reimbursed basically for the tax that inflation tax that should have paid. So that's the idea. So this way, we only inflated the people that are using the token to store data. Because if you're using data to store data, then you can simultaneously also deposit it to this DAO. Right? So, so that is our way to collect this rent um, uh, over time. And this, this issuance is behaving like a cron job, right? So for consensus folks, right? So that's like a clockwork. Every block, you know, there's gonna be a little bit of issuance. So depending on how much uh, how much time you, st you store your stuff in the blockchain, then that's, uh, that's the duration you're going to be inflated. Um, you're going to be collected rent with inflation, target inflation. Okay, so minor conflation, uh, minor compensation basically in includes base issuance, which eventually drops to zero, right? After, after you know, some years, like Bitcoin dropped to zero. And that's okay, because we always have the state rent income with the second issuance. This is always there. This is always there constant. So miners, will have predictable income over time uh, via state rent. And this is guarantees that even if there's no transaction at all, this blockchain will keep going, right? Um, that uh, as a preservation focus blockchain, not transactions. So we're not afraid of you know, all transactions moving to layer two, I think that's perfectly fine. And plus fees, right? So this transaction fee is much like uh, Ethereum decimal. Okay, um, so this is more so to um, right, I think most, most of this I've talked about, so this is more like a summary, right? For security, sustainable token issues, the limit is what happens after hard cap combo, right? On the other hand, you also want to protect the interests of long-term token holders. So if you deposit your token in normal style, it's the second issuance is uh, as if it doesn't exist, right? So as if you're holding a hard cap token, just like a Bitcoin, right? Because you, you put it there, you always will get your your part of the, the inflation back, right, through some sort of like interest income, if you will. So this is a way that you can balance between the problem of, you know, you know, having a hard cap allow people to, you know, incentive people to hold your tokens, but on the other hand, yeah, it is the incentive problem. So this is only possible with something like a smart contract platform. Uh, in Bitcoin, this would be. And then, you know, we show this, how we can do the heavy asset problem, right? So we talk about this. And then the, um, <laughs> we come with something called heavier asset stronger bag. Right? Basically the bag has to be able to capture part of the asset value that you host, right? So more assets custody with the more capacity used with a higher minor income, which would be higher uh, security. And then this is a, this is more of a assumption that higher security you know, people are more willing to put their assets in something that's more secure. Therefore, you know, this loop will just will run. So it means people were more willing to, if it's more secure, people are more willing to put into it, and then more capacity will use and give money more income to generate more security. Um, okay, I think this, uh, yeah, so align interest, right? So we talk about other platform may not be aligning their interest, but for us, it's really easy, right? So miners want more income, higher token price, users, more higher, higher user price, more security, which is more mining income, and then hollers, higher token price. So basically, higher token price supports everybody's objective. And this is much, this community will be much easier to design a governance uh, mechanism for, because everybody is like the same. Okay. Um, yeah, so again, back to, you know, trying to comments. Try to give security comments and try to give storage comments. I think we talked about storage comments before. Security comments is asset tokens don't just ride on the platform security provided by platform holders, platform token holders for free, but also they contribute to security by generating demand to occupy state. How do you couple the economic demand on your upper layer things with your own platform tokens? Because otherwise, you will have this heavy bag, um, heavy asset problem. Right, so you, your own token may not generate any demand. <coughs> okay, so value capture, right, um, directly turn demand of asset tokens into the platform token. That's how you generate, at least for us, that's how we generate, uh, you know, uh, capture value of the uh, ecosystem. And then for resistance, um, 
first order use case, network effect. But I think more important here is, you know, when you think about forking, uh, at least the way we look at the forking is, okay, let's say the next second after somebody fork us, you know, what is there an obvious reason people should support, you know, the original chain instead of the forked one? And then there are, you know, for example, if you have a chain that your value proposition is TPS, right? Then if I fork your chain, at the next second, I will have the same TPS as you can, probably even less, because my chain is going to be empty, right? So it's going to be cheaper, um, right? So that value proposition is going to be competition to uh, for your users. Whereas, you know, if we look at Bitcoin, for example, it's been forked so many times, Bitcoin's value purpose is not transaction capabilities, but security. For the next second, you can fork all the code and even all the stake of the chain, but you're not going to fork miners, right? You can't push up security from day one. So, uh, so that's the way we think about this. Um, okay, so summary, so these are the really the, the objectives that we look at the economic design for neurals, right? So uh, we want to have more of a not transaction based, but store of value, store of asset based. Um, and then we want to be able to align, have aligned incentives, value capture, and then, uh, you know, this is more to add a dimension of time to um, the uh, to the economic model, other than just to facilitate consensus, more movement of time. Right? So that's sustainability. Um, yeah, that's that's all I got.